This is a lecture from Open Tuition. For the free lecture notes that go with this podcast, please visit opentuition.com. Now we're going to start looking at the elements of the rational planning model in a little bit more detail. Uh, this uh, video deals with uh, the mission and stakeholder appraisal. First of all, the uh, mission. And the mission can be uh, defined, if you like, as uh, the purpose of the organisation. What is it there for? What is it being created for? What is it really setting out to do? So within a profit-seeking organisation, uh, the mission will ultimately be to earn profit, but they will not normally mention profit. It will say something like, we want to be the most successful car manufacturer in the world, or something of that sort. It is now fashionable for missions to be formally drafted into a mission statement. These are often found in companies' websites, uh, and sometimes they're published with the annual reports. Uh, a mission statement is about uh, half a page and nobody wants to read much more than that. They don't necessarily believe what it's saying anyway. And typically what it will cover will be the purpose of the organisation. Something about its position. There will be a difference between the mission of, say, Nissan cars and Mercedes cars. Uh, Nissan cars, we want to be the best car manufacturer in the world of good value family cars, perhaps. Mercedes will probably say we want to be the best manufacturer in the world of executive cars. Just just kind of differentiating slightly where they see their purpose in a little bit more detail in terms of the market. Most organisations then follow up this key purpose and position uh, with uh, quite a lot of uh, writing about their uh, values, their culture and their ethics. Uh, uh, elements like uh, we will be uh, fair recruiters, we will try to uh, allow all employees to advance to the uh, best of their ability. Uh, we will uh, seek to reduce uh, emission of greenhouse gases and we will seek to increase the amount of waste we recycle and so on. We will comply with the, the laws of each country. We will be good corporate citizens and uh, so on. We hold our customers in the highest possible esteem. And you can see that uh, uh, all companies and all organisations are all going to say nice things here. No company is going to say something like our mission is to sell goods of the minimum possible quality at the highest possible price. Uh, so uh, the missions are sometimes criticised a little bit uh, because these uh, elements here become what you might call very kind of seamy. Everyone's going to be saying roughly the same nice things there. However, there, there can be a purpose in that. If your employees buy into these values, culture and ethics, then maybe you don't have to watch or uh, supervise your employees as much. They have absorbed the, these good messages and you can trust them a little bit more to do the right thing. Mission statements are often uh, criticised, they're often a bit pie in the sky. Uh, they often have, for example, internal conflicts. Uh, you have a purpose maybe which is ultimately to make good profits, uh, but then in your values, culture and ethics you have uh, nice thoughts about um, you know, reducing emissions, not, not destroying countryside and so on if the uh, sort of uh, operations you carry on might be might be doing that. And we have to think where, where is a balance actually to be found. But emissions can be quite useful. If, if nothing else, it will maybe make management think this is the purpose of our mission, this is what we're here for, and we don't want to abandon that too quickly. Though sometimes you need to abandon it. Sometimes circumstances force you to change. Uh, so we saw that in Kodak, it couldn't keep saying our mission is to produce very good colour film. We may be seeing it now on uh, television uh, channels, where the mission might have been to broadcast to everybody. Now they're thinking maybe more to produce entertainment which is available on demand and delivered over the internet. So missions do have to bow in the face of circumstances. Next, uh, we have stakeholders, and a stakeholder can be defined as anyone uh, affecting by, affecting or affected by an organisation. 
And the key thing about your stakeholders is often what they want is going to be in conflict. So your shareholders, they, they will want profits up. Uh, but your employees, they want the wages up. So there's a potential conflict there. If you're near an airport, if you're running an airport uh, uh, here, maybe your managers want kind of 24-7 operations of the airport, uh, but maybe the local people want something more like, uh, you know, kind of 10 hours a day. And your managers, the local people 10 hours a day, but maybe only six days a week. And again, there's a, a, a bit of a conflict going on. Conflict, to some extent, is inevitable. Uh, different people want different things from the business and it is the purpose of a management to try to manage the conflict so that you can try to keep most people happy most of the time. What you don't want is conflicts escalating so that perhaps there's a strike if your employees are very unhappy or maybe the local people come and kind of boycott or you make some sort of protest or lie down on the runways of the airport or something. Uh, because they, they feel that they are being unfairly dealt with. If you're dealing with stakeholders, then the model or framework to think about is what's called Mendeleev's Matrix. And here, stakeholders are set out on these, uh, this quadrant here according to their power. Have they got power to influence the organisation? And secondly, their interest. An interest is really how likely are they to exercise that power and if, it's, uh, if they've got high interest, then they're likely to be very active, likely to do something about it. If they're low interest, they're likely to be very passive. And it's for management to try and uh, judge, if you like, where different stakeholders lie in these uh, four sections. And if we put them on here, they go by these names. First of all, the key players. These are people who have got high power and we know that they're very active, they're perhaps very militant, maybe a very tra tra uh, strong trade union or something of, of, of that sort. By and large, these people can stop a strategy in its tracks. If they're employees, they could go on strike, costing you a lot of money. If they're customers, they could simply abandon you because they, they don't like what you're doing. If it is the shareholders, then they can come to the AGM and, if necessary, they can sack the, the, the directors. So these people really are, are kind of come first in the queue. Uh, you have to keep them sweet. You have to give them pretty much what they want. Then we have the keep satisfied. People who have power in theory, but are, are fairly kind of laid back, fairly passive, are unlikely to exercise it unless they are provoked sufficiently. And if they were provoked sufficiently, they could get so irritated, they might actually take action. But these people, you just give them enough. Give them enough to kind of keep them satisfied. Make sure you give them a wage increase of inflation. Uh, you might have to give your key players a wage increase of inflation plus 5%. Uh, but your, 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 your people who are uh, in the keep satisfied uh, category are less militant. It might be just their culture, it might be professional reasons. Uh, if you were a doctor or a nurse working in a hospital, it's unlikely that you would go on strike because you didn't like your pay. If you're in uh, an organization uh, without those perhaps professional or ethical considerations, uh, uh, which would be inhibiting you maybe going on strike, then maybe you're more of a key player. Keep informed are, to some extent, sadly deluded people. Uh, they don't have much power, but make a lot of noise. They, they, they want you to know that they're there. They don't like what you're doing, but they can't do much about it other than to shout and protest and, and so on. These people you keep informed. First, it's polite. You know, you, nobody likes being ignored. That, that only agitates more. And secondly, by keeping them informed, uh, what you're actually planning, or what you're actually doing, may not be as bad as they fear. Uh, often a lot of rumours go around and stoke sort of resentment and resistance. We in the UK get uh, a lot of people in this sort of category every time we want to build a new airport or a new railway or a new road. All the local people kind of are likely to be uh, protesting 
their power can be relatively low depending on what the uh, the, the planning uh, judgments have been but that doesn't stop them agitating uh, uh, quite a lot to try to get the uh, the route of the rail railway for example changed and finally we have people who are minimal effort here these are kind of last in the queue uh, to, to, to some extent you can ignore these people uh, telling people that they're going to be ignored isn't very nice. Minimal effort is a kind of more politically acceptable way of, of, of telling these people, look, you, you don't have much power, you're not actually act very interested in what's happening anyway, you're going to be right at the end of the queue uh, when it comes to uh, you know, dividing up the cake uh, to, see, to see what you're going to get from this organisation. Again, uh, it's inevitable that there will be conflicts. You can sometimes have two uh, lots of key players uh, here who may want different things, and in which case management is going to have to be uh, quite clever at trying to deal with these disputes.